power creep. The escalation of power levels into absurd tiers that end up breaking your story. You've seen the title and thumbnail. I don't think power creep is as bad as people say it is in Naruto. Is it perfect? Of course not, but let me show you why Naruto handles power creep much better than many of its shonen counterparts. The biggest complaint people have about power creep in Naruto is that by the end of the series, the characters are no longer ninjas, but demigods. But we have to keep in mind two things. In a shonen series, it is a given that the characters will become progressively stronger. Also, we have to keep in mind that Naruto and Sasuke, aka the protagonists, will eventually be the strongest characters in the series. The last important thing to keep in mind is that the villains, with some exceptions, will also be stronger and get progressively stronger along the series. So let's take a look at the power levels of Naruto, Sasuke and the main arc villains throughout the series to see if the power escalation was handled correctly and if it makes sense with the story and themes Kishimoto was trying to develop. But before that, please leave a like and subscribe. I am just asking this right now because I know people will eventually forget to do so and it really helps the channel a lot. Our two main characters start off as Genin, very low level shinobi, they are not even close to the top tier ninjas in the verse. Still, they both show a lot of potential dormant power, especially Naruto with the QB. The villains of the first arc, Zabuza and Haku, are actually pretty strong if compared to an average ninja in the world, Zabuza being a jonin, and that's a thing people tend to forget, especially when we read Shippuden, but jonin level is actually a pretty big deal. Most ninja will never reach the jonin rank and remain a chunin for the rest of their lives, only the top 1% will ever reach that level. It's just that the story follows the most powerful characters in the verse eventually, so we get that false impression that Jonins are always fodder, but that is only the case when they are compared to the most powerful ninjas in the world and people with 6 age fat power and all, all that thing. In the second arc of the show, the antagonists actually get weaker for the most part. Among the competitors in the tuning exam, there is probably no one that can beat Sabuza and Haku with the arguable exception of Gara. Still, this arc introduces Orochimaru, one of the most powerful villains in classic Naruto, but he's not the main antagonist faced by the two main characters. Instead, he faces up Hiruzen at the end of the arc, and we get to see the first Kage level battle in the second arc of the anime, which establishes how a fight between two S-tier ninjas in the universe looks like. But in this arc, we also get to see a 12-year-old Naruto defeating a tail beast, a full tail beast in Shukaku. Granted, he had a lot of help from Gamabunta, but still, I will not argue with you if you say that Naruto vs. Gara was a Kage level fight. So, if you really are pissed about the power creep and the escalation at the end of Naruto Shippuden, you should probably be pissed at the tuning exams for showing that baby Naruto can defeat an opponent that only 0.1% of ninjas in the verse have a chance of surviving a fight against. But no one is mad at the tuning exam because it's one of the best arcs in shonen and anime history. And if you think about it, this fight opens a huge can of worms that most people just don't like to acknowledge. For example, why doesn't Naruto summon Gamabunta in his fight against Sasuke? Sorry, but Sasuke would have no chance. And Naruto does not do that because it would be, of course, unfulfilling for the narrative, even though it would make so much sense. You can come up with some in-universe explanations, such as Gamabunta wouldn't want to help Naruto in that situation, or he didn't have enough chakra, or he just wanted to fight Sasuke by himself. But the thing is that Naruto has the power to defeat a full-tailed beast at 12 and never uses this power again pre-time skip. Yet, you see no one complaining about it because the Sasuke retrieval arc is amazing and I am not complaining about it either. The bottom line is that during classic Naruto, Naruto and Sasuke both gain many new abilities and end the series at a much higher power level. In the final valley fight, pre-time skip, they are both at a very high chunin level and possibly bordering jonin level when they are fully transformed with the QB or the curse mark. It is interesting that the power level of villains fluctuate a lot uh, pre-time skip. 
First we have Zabuz and Haku, which are Jonin level. Then we have the tuning exams, where the candidates are either Gaiman or Chunin level. Then Orochimaru, which is Kage level, and then Itachi, which is the strongest ninja we see in classic Naruto. After that we have Nerf Orochimaru, which is probably still Kage level. And then the sound 4 for the last arc, which are probably the weakest antagonists, main antagonists at least, in classic Naruto. And that's likely because they don't have any substantial fights against our main characters. They mostly fight secondary characters. And then uh, the very last antagonist is Kimimaru, which is probably Jonin level, probably relative to Zabuza and Haku, I would say. So at least in the beginning of the series, the power escalation of villains, unlike the one of our main characters, is definitely not linear. And that's not a bad thing, not at all. We get to see fights with characters that are way above what our protagonists could currently dish out. And as I said before, I never saw anyone complaining about power creep in pre-time skip, even though it's kind of all over the place, the power level fluctuates a lot. The main characters follow an evolution that makes sense, and they only become more powerful in a way we understand and that is fulfilling. Classic Naruto gives us a good point of measurement as to what the top ninjas in the verse are capable of. Itachi, Hiruzen, and Orochimaru are the strongest shinobi we get to see in action before the time skip, and they can serve as a really good point of comparison to characters that show up later in Shippuden, and so we can determine if the power escalation is happening too fast, or if they, these characters that appear in the future get more powerful than Hiruzen, and Itachi, and Orochimaru. Essentially, these three characters serve as a power ceiling as to what the peak of the power in the universe looks like, at least in classic Naruto. And we're gonna be looking for things that break this power ceiling during Shippuden and see if they make sense or not. Also, some people forget that the Kakashi Gaiden arc happens in between classic and Shippuden in the manga, which means that the power level of Minato is another measurement we can use that is very close to classic Naruto, the part of the series most people consider faithful to its premise and better at balancing power levels. So now we begin Shippuden, and Naruto has gotten stronger, of course. After the power skip, he trained with Jiraiya and got some pretty interesting new powers. He can spar with Kakashi well enough not to embarrass himself, but he does practically nothing in the first arc, to be honest. He only attacks an armless, chakraless Deidara using a two-tailed mantle. However, things do get much more interesting, and we get to see the power escalating much better in the second arc. So when we see the four-tailed version of QB using the Bijudama, a technique that shifted the power dynamics in Naruto. It was something very different at the time it was introduced, much more akin to something you would see in Dragon Ball, a purely explosive, destructive sphere of energy thrown at Orochimaru. That was something we may not have expected to see when watching classic Naruto, but the QB was established to be a beast able to destroy mountains just by waving its tail, so I can definitely accept a Bijudama, so just a very powerful attack capable of insane destruction. And still, we see that a very weakened Orochimaru was able to deal with the version 2 four-tailed QB well enough, and I have no doubt that Itachi, Minato, and Hiruzen would do the same. So the power ceiling established in classic Naruto was definitely not broken by that. On the other hand, when we see Sasuke for the first time after the time skip, he got much more powerful, uh, insanely more powerful than Naruto got during the time skip. The first time we see him in Shippuden, he is already Kage level. Easily soloing a squad with two uh, Anbu Jonins, Naruto and Sakura, and showing a level of speed only seen before in Minato and Itachi. I mean, I can easily see this Sasuke stomping Kage like Mei and Tsunade. Still, Itachi and Minato and Hiruzen would easily take care of beginning of Shippuden Sasuke, so he is not yet at the top of the verse, not even close. But we can see that our main characters are starting to gain some momentum and getting up there in the tier of the universe. In the next arc, Naruto learns the Rasen Shuriken, a Kage-level jutsu, 
and defeat an Akatsuki member. Granted, Kakuzu fought Kakashi and Team Asuma for a while before Naruto shows up, and he had loads of backup in that fight. But still, we can see that base Naruto is at Jonin level now, easily, but not yet close to being the top of the universe, because the only thing he really has going for him is, a, is an imperfect Rotten Shuriken. Also, none of the Shippuden antagonists so far have surpassed the level of Itachi, Hiruzen, or Orochimaru. They would be at most relative to those characters, but I don't see anyone arguing with me if I say that Itachi is taking Deidara, Sasori, Kakuzu, and Hidden any day of the week. Sasuke then becomes stronger by improving his Chidori and absorbing Orochimaru, and goes on to kill Deidara by himself, a Kage level character that devoted a lot of time just to counter the Sharingan abilities. A pretty impressive feat that definitely puts Sasuke in mid Kage level, perhaps even higher. Also, in this fight, we see another paradigm shift in the Naruto power levels. Deidara C0's self destructive bomb was by far the most powerful technique we had ever seen in Naruto in terms of raw, pure strength. Able to open a giant 10km wide crate and level an entire forest. So, this escalation of power was done in a way that makes sense. Deidara is the explosions guy, and his technique should be well related to explosions. In his final jutsu, requires a suicide to be achieved, so yeah, it should be very powerful, and I think it really shows that Kishimoto had something in mind when doing that. Sasuke then goes on to fight Itachi, and we see powers that Itachi hadn't shown us in classic Naruto, mainly the Susano and its attachments. Now, you could argue that this is where the Megazords were introduced into Naruto, and the Megazords, I mean these massive corporeal jutsus that are controlled by the user, just like the Megazords. And some people don't like those types of things in Naruto because they are something more commonly seen in mecha anime, and not an anime about ninjas. But Itachi Susano wasn't nearly as large as things we saw before, such as Shukaku and the Sanin summons. Still, we expected Itachi's power level to be very high, and seeing him having all these broken abilities did not go against anything the series established before. And let's be real, the Susano just looks so cool. After the Itachi fight, Sasuke is both nerfed and buffed by losing Orochimaru's powers but, and the curse mark but gaining the Mangaku Sharingan, so he definitely grows in power even though he loses some of it. He then fights B and manages to defeat the A Tails, a very impressive feat, even though he needed a lot of help in that fight. B is established as a very powerful character, which would be very problematic for Orochimaru and Hinuzen to face, especially considering the full Biju transformation, but Itachi and Minato could easily take care of him, so he doesn't really break the power ceiling established before. However, we can see that our main characters and their antagonists are now reaching and even starting to exceed the upper levels of powers that were seen in classic Naruto. Next milestone is Naruto learning Sage Mode, which easily puts him in mid Kage level, perhaps even higher. And then comes Pain or Nagato, which at this point of the series is the most powerful character we have seen in terms of chakra levels and raw power. And rightly so, I mean, he's the leader of the Akatsuki, the organization Itachi and Orochimaru belong to. It would make no sense for him to be weaker than those characters. Now, I think Minato could kind of easily take the paths of pain in a fight, but he is not more powerful than them in a raw sense of the word. I also think that there is an argument that Itachi could beat the Paths of Pain in the right conditions. However, Pain definitely reaches the highest level of power in the verse that we've seen so far. He fights Sage Mode Naruto while very fatigued from fighting the entire village at the same time and then blowing it up, and he even wins that fight. The QB has to come in and save Naruto, but Sage Mode alone and all those frog summonings were not enough to beat Pain. He's now the new power ceiling, but he didn't destroy the previous one, he just kind of expanded it. Up until this point, the power progression in Naruto Shippuden has been pretty constant and it made a lot of sense with the story. 
Our main characters have gained powers that put them among the S tiers of the verse, and it is after the pain arc that most people start to have big problems with Naruto power creep and the series in general. However, I have to disagree with that statement, at least regarding the follow-up arc, the Five Kage Summit. Many people just ignore this arc, but I think it, it actually is a pretty good one, and it deserves more credit. That happens probably because the arc is in that limbo in between the pain arc and the war arc. Some people really don't like Sasuke, so they, they just don't watch the arc. But if you haven't read or watched this arc in a while, I definitely recommend you to do so. In the Five Kage Summit, we basically see Sasuke using his mangaku to fight Five Kage one after the other, which obviously puts him into high Kage level. We are introduced to all Kage as well, and we see that A is very fast, Onoki is very hacks, Mei is very fodder, and Danzo is also hacks. These characters are literally supposed to be the strongest characters of their respective nations, so them being strong makes perfect sense with the narrative and everything else. Sasuke is also not leagues above any of them, although I think he would win a one-on-one -on -one fight against any of the five Kage we see in the summit. He does go blind at the end of the ordeal, and we see that his powers did have a cost. It's also safe to say that none of these characters come close to break the power ceiling established by paying the previous arc, but nevertheless, they are pretty powerful. Now I want to talk a little bit about someone I've been ignoring thus far, Obito. He's one of the main antagonists during the entire Shibden era, but he doesn't really do much fighting up until the war arc. And it is difficult to determine his real strength because, you know, he's pure hacks. But I think it's safe to say that he is relative to Nagato and Itachi, and Minato to some extent. Some people may say that he is just way stronger than any of the Akatsuki members, and I think he could probably beat them all in a one-on-one -on -one fight, but I do think people tend to exaggerate Orange Mask Obito's power level. I think he is strong, but I think Itachi for one has a decent chance of taking him. I mean, if he was so powerful, he wouldn't really need the Akatsuki to achieve his plans. He would just get all the Jinchuriki, kill all the Kagi, and execute the Eye of the Moon plan. He was clearly hesitant to cross Itachi during the entire show and was confident enough to ward an attack against Konoha only after he died. So he at least respected Itachi's strength. But I don't think Orange Mask Obito was in another tier of strength. I mean,. He had to use Izanagi to survive a battle against Conan, and even though she was prepared and he went in underestimating her, I can't see people like Madara or even War Arc Obito struggling too much against her. Now I'll address the main complaint I see when people talk about power creep in Naruto. Their argument is that Naruto as a series betrayed itself, and ninjas are no longer ninjas because they start to use abilities that have nothing to do with stealth and the way people think ninjas are supposed to operate. Therefore, the world building was ruined and the series lost its spirit. Now, the only thing that matters is who has the most powerful nuke-like ability to explode the enemy, and this is just, well, not true. I don't agree with that statement. First, let's take a look at the beginning of the show. Our main characters definitely learn that hiding from the enemy and knowing when a trap is set for you is important. We see that in action in the Land of Waves arc, with Zabuza using his mist to sneak around silently like an assassin. However, in the very first arc, the arc where they were supposed to be real ninjas, we already see jutsus that are very conspicuous. Or are you gonna tell me that a giant water dragon is stealthy, or a massive fireball, or Chidori that literally sounds like a thousand birds singing and is really bright. So no, later in Shippuden when techniques get really large, using the stealth argument is not valid because they have always used techniques that are not stealthy since the beginning. Also, they can still use stealth and deception and have these non-stealthy abilities at the same time, they're not mutually exclusive. 
For example, Jiraiya infiltrated the Rain Village using very stealthy abilities and acting more like your traditional ninja, but when he fought Pain, he used many conspicuous abilities, like the massive Rasengan or the Frog Ninjutsu. In the war arc, when Aruto masters the QB Chakra mode, he starts to shine very bright, which makes stealth very difficult to achieve. But you have to understand that Naruto has never tried to be a stealthy character. He's always been bad at it and never really cared about concealing himself. Instead, he always faced the problems he had head on, and that aligns with the themes of the series and the argument that characters are not stealthy anymore just doesn't work. Another argument is that the show just lost all of its strategic factor and fights just became a struggle to see who has the most powerful jutsu and they just became an explosions contest. And for people who think that, I ask, have you ever seen the show? Or read the manga? Saying that the characters no longer fight with strategy in Lake Shippuden is so wrong. Just watch Obito vs Naruto Kakashi Gaen B, or Madara vs the Five Kage, or Jubito vs Naruto Sasuke Tobirama and Minato, or Madara vs Gai and his retinue. They still use strategy and think like ninjas, trying to counter the enemy's moves and using their weaknesses to their advantage. Just because they are stronger, it doesn't mean that they no longer think tactically in a fight. Obviously, different characters will use a different amount of planning and strategy during their fights. I mean, Shikamaru will always have more planning involved in his fight than Rock Lee, but that doesn't mean strategy dies off during the war arc. It's like when you're playing D&D with your party at level 1, well, you will strategize to beat lower level enemies, and then when you reach level 20, you will strategize to beat higher level enemies. Of course, you'll have hacks abilities and all that when you reach higher levels, but the enemies also have them, so naturally you have to find a way to work around the enemy's higher abilities with your higher abilities. Also, a lot of people complain about the Megazords that are introduced during the war arc, such as the Perfect Susano, the QB Avatar, and the Buddha statues. And they say that these monstrosities have no place in Naruto. These people, however, forget that the second arc of the story literally ended with a kaiju fight in Gara versus Naruto using Gabunta and Shukaku. So that's not really a very valid argument. The third arc of the show also ended in a kaiju fight with a three-way deadlock. So. There have always been very large things that are powerful in Naruto. It's just that now they are more powerful. Hell, the first panel in the entire manga talked about a giant nine-tailed fox that could destroy mountains just by waving its tail. And when Kishimoto shows us what that power looks like, people lose their minds. It's natural that the main characters and villains will eventually achieve that kind of power if said power was established in the very first page of the series. And we even know that our main protagonist has that power sealed within him. Now, if you think they look silly, then that's a matter of taste, but large creatures and jutsus have always been in the series since the very beginning. So the argument that stealth is no longer used is not valid, because it is still used, and in the beginning they still had big jutsus and still used stealth. Well, having said all that, let's talk about the war arc now. And this is where the problems lie, most of them at least. The war arc is the messiest arc in the entire story, and power creep follows that trend in the arc. Naruto first learns KCM1 in the beginning of the arc and gets a significant boost in power if compared to Sage Mode. He is relative in speed to the Raikage and has a lot of extra destructive potential in his arsenal. However, for the first half of the war arc, the power levels are actually very much in control, there isn't much escalation, and we are not really introduced to any new antagonists that surpass the previous ones. I mean, the most powerful villains we see in the first half of the arc were Itachi and Nagato, and they didn't really do anything new that we hadn't seen in Uin before, so the power ceiling doesn't really expand that much. It's only Naruto that gets more powerful. And, well, up until this point, I can easily see Itachi, Hiruzen, and Orochimaru, the top tiers of classic Naruto, being relative to any of the characters we see fighting in the show. But this is just the calm before the storm. The largest escalation in power takes place midway through the war arc. 
The power had been scaling pretty consistently up until this point, until this fatidical event happened. Yes, Madara Uchiha shows up and shatters the power ceiling previously established. He's not only superior in taijutsu, raw chakra power, precognition, and intellect than any of the characters we saw before, but he also has jutsus that are absolutely broken in terms of pure strength and hacks. He casually summons a giant meteor on the 4th battalion. Oh no, actually he summons two giant meteors on the 4th battalion. And he does it casually. When we saw techniques on that scale before, such as Chibaku Tensei and C-Zero, they usually had a high cost and were a one-time jutsu only, used when extremely necessary. But when Madara just summons two meteors as easily as cooking omelet, that makes a statement about your power levels. We now know the new power level we should expect to see from our antagonists, and the strength our main characters will eventually reach. And after this moment, the power scaling in the show just grows exponentially. In the second half of the war arc, we see characters thousands of times stronger than the strongest characters we knew before. Still, I'm getting ahead of myself. First, let's discuss whether Edo Madara's extreme powers are justifiable and fit the narrative. Well, if you take into consideration that Madara was being hyped and built up since Naruto and Sasuke first fought in the Valley of the End, and his name was and lore were thrown around during Shippuden every other chapter, always building up to a character of epic and legendary strength, I think it definitely fits for him to be that powerful. When you build up the legend of a character for 300 chapters, you can't expect anything else but overwhelming power. Plus, he's just so badass and I can't complain about it. I mean, I really like Madara. I try not to be a really huge fanboy, but I just think he's a very cool character. But when a character fights the five Kage, which are supposed to be each the strongest characters of their nations, well, while toying with them, utterly toying with them, you know you got an OP character in your hands. Still, I think Madara is an amazing character with a deep personality and complex construction. Him being powerful is the cherry on top, but he functions as a perfect antagonist for that time of the story. Another antagonist that breaks through the previous power ceiling is Rinnegan Obito. Once he gets Madara's eye, his power increases exponentially. Not only does he gain more chakra, raw strength, and durability, but he also is able to control six Jinchuriki and even use the full tail beast simultaneously. He's not as strong as Madara, but we needed Naruto, the protagonist, B, the strongest Jinchuriki at that point, Guy, Konoha's strongest Jonin, and Kakashi the only character with a jutsu that can directly counter Kamui to hold Obito at bay. We can also put Sage Mode Kabuto in this upper level of power, but I don't see him being as powerful as Obito or Madara. However, he can use a perfected version of the Edo Tensei, which arguably makes him the most powerful character in the show, since he was the one to summon Madara and all that, but... Well, that, that's not too relevant, I don't want to get too deep into that, but... Kabuto is also stronger than any of the characters pre-war arc. It's after this point that we see our main characters breaking through the power ceiling that we knew before as Naruto masters KCM2 and Sasuke masters the Eternal Monk Akio Sharingan. They are now at a level way above any of the characters we saw before the second half of the war arc, and that's to be expected when villains rise in power so must the protagonists. Also, Naruto befriending Kurama and Sasuke getting the EMS make absolute sense within the narrative and theme, so there's nothing to complain about in here. Another milestone of power escalation happened when Madara banffed his perfect Susano and showed the five Kage that they had absolutely nothing that they could throw at Madara to beat him. That was a moment we saw that no matter how much strategy they used, clever tactics and determination, the five Kage could not be compared to Madara, they were simply ants. Some people may argue that this is a bad thing since Madara only busted his Susano and immediately won the fight, 
But I think there was an amazing moment in the series when we felt true desperation and awe. Plus, I really like the look of the perfect Susano, so I am not really complaining about it. At this point of the story, we also get to see my favorite volume of the manga, which is volume 65, that tells the story of Madara and Hashirama in the past. Seriously, the story in this volume is so well told, and Madara vs Hashirama is such a good fight. We see the absurd power levels these characters reach with the Buddha statue and the majestic attire Susano, and we can clearly see that both characters use strategy the entire time during the fight, even if they're essentially fighting a kaiju battle. And honestly, I wouldn't have that fight any other way. Their confrontation was hyped since we saw their statues in the final valley, so it had to have epic proportions. Up until now, even when the power creeps start to really set in with all the Madara and Hashirama shenanigans, everything still made sense with the narrative, and we didn't have anything that could potentially break the universe. However, that starts to change when they summon the Jubi. Now, the Ten Tails being an absolute force of nature makes sense, since it's the power of all tail beasts combined. I also mostly like when Juby fights the Alliance. I mean, yeah, it can nuke cities in other continents, but, well, that's to be expected, right? It's nature incarnate. Things really get weird when Obito becomes the Jinchuriki of the Juby, being the first character we see that breaks through the new power ceiling that just was recently established by Madara and Hashirama. And yes, Jubito is indeed very strong, but I think Kishimoto finally started to show the cracks in the way he scaled the power during the war arc. Jubito is so powerful that his jutsus just are not very cool. I mean, they're kind of unimaginative. He can nullify regular ninjutsu and he has the good Odama, which can disintegrate everything they touch, but that's kind of it, and they are not impressive to look at and not very interesting. I just think his arsenal could have more variety, but if he did, then, well, he would probably be too much for the protagonist to handle. Kishimoto had to nerve him so that he wouldn't be able to use Kamoi while being in the Jubitin Churiki state, otherwise beating him would be completely impossible. But him not being able to face through dimensions while carrying that massive amount of chakra kind of makes sense within the narrative, and I don't hold that against the story. However, in that part of the story, the secondary characters kind of lose their relevance entirely since they can do anything against the Jubi Jinchuriki. But well, uh, Jubito is defeated and even though it was kind of corny the way it happened, it's uh, somewhat satisfying. And then Madara becomes the Jubi Jinchuriki instead. Another one. And once again, the power ceiling just established by Jubito is completely shattered by Jubidara because he is much stronger than Jubito. But, well... He has one of the coolest fights in the entire series against 8th Gate Guy and his support squad. 8th Gate Guy shows a power that was definitely relative to Jubito and he almost kills Jubidara, even though he needed help from Kakashi, Guy, Lee and Gara, and Jubidara was far from the peak of his power, 8th Gate Guy is easily among the strongest characters in the show, and I love that because Ga well, Guy is just so cool. After that, our main characters gain access to the powers of the Sage of Six Paths and reach the new power ceiling established by Jubidara. Now, do I like the way they gained their new powers? No. Do I like the way they are now reincarnations of Ashra and Indra? No. But I really like their power-ups. The Rinnegan and the Six Path Sage Mode and the new jutsu that accompanies them all, uh, they're very cool and they work perfectly with the narrative. Jubidara gets his second Rinnegan, absorbs the Divine Tree, and now it's on. Our main antagonist that was built up for hundreds of chapters at the peak of the power in the universe versus our main characters with the powers that rival those of the Sage of Six Paths. It's going to be an epic fight. What's better, Jubidara actually has interesting abilities, unlike Jubito. He uses that purple lightning, Limbo, and he's now casually dropping dozens of giant meteors, even larger than the ones he summoned before on the 4th Battalion, 
While Naruto and Sasuke are able to block those meteors with their newly gained abilities, the new perfect Susano and the extremely powerful new Rosengan varieties are so cool, it's a clash of titans. Naruto and Sasuke will get help from Kakashi, Sakura, and the Edo Hokage as well for the fight, and this is just going to be the battle of battles that will decide the fate of the shinobi world. This fight will last for like 20 chapters and will be a roller coaster of emotions. Kakashi dies, sacrificing himself to give the final opening so that Naruto and Sasuke can seal Madara after the most epic fight in the series. The final fight, when the characters can no longer get stronger because they are already at the top. And therefore, the series will end after that. With a good escalation of strength that was able to keep power creep at bay for the most part, and even though the power scales got insanely high at the end, things ultimately make sense and seeing how our protagonists progressed it was such a pleasant experience. Oh, that's not what happened? Oh no, apparently Madara is scaled off in the most disappointing and stupid way it could have ever been done. And he is replaced by a chick named Kaguya, which completely destroys the build-up of the entire series, both emotionally and mechanically. She shatters the power scales in a way that is so dissatisfying that my investment on the series becomes null. She essentially becomes so powerful that the entire power scale collapses into itself, and now everything we built up is irrelevant. I mean, Kaguya, she is so strong that she can take a head-on attack from a perfect Susano without even using a blocking technique, and the Susano shatters. Ninjutsu does not work against her, and you could argue that they didn't work against Jubidara and Jubito, but there were ways to go around that. Sage mode for one, and also, once Naruto and Sasuke got six paths powers, uh, all of their jutsu were working just fine on Jubidara. Having techniques that work against your enemy is important for the dynamic of the fight. If everything just fizzles out when it touches Kaguya, then that's pretty boring. And because of that, the fight devolves into a very high level taijutsu contest that does not have the grit or excitement of taijutsu fights we saw before from much weaker characters. To make things even worse, Kaguya's powers are really whack. She uses bones, which were cool with Kimimaru, but uh, I expected something else from the final boss of the series. She can also teleport to different dimensions, which is kind of cool, but it only serves to separate the main characters. And ultimately, it's not a very interesting technique. Uh, Kaguya is also extremely dumb. She can strategize to save her life, literally. And that's a huge disappointment, because Madara and Obito were very tactical fighters. In that fight, uh, when Kaguya versus Naruto and Sasuke, that's when the show devolved into let's see who has the strongest blast in jutsu or punch harder because, well, Kaguya could not do anything strategically. Well, her side of the fight was just, well, I'm gonna use this ability, which is very strong, but I don't know why I'm using it. Sure, Team 7 did strategize, but, I mean, the fight was just crap. Kakashi uses his perfect Susano, which is nice and good fan service, if not a bit goofy, and they defeat Kaguya in a very unengaging way. I mean, it's nice to see the ending where they seal Kaguya and Kakashi says he likes them, but it's just emotional baggage we had from before. It's not because of the fight we're experiencing now. And if uncontrollable power creep was barely being contained at the end of the war arc, Kaguya, well, absolutely shatters it. And, well, she goes against the show's core ideals about ninja. I mean, she is literally not a ninja, she's a goddamn alien. And she really starts this trend of terrible antagonists that continues in Boruto. Oh no. I just remembered that Boruto exists. Fine, let's talk about that piece of crap, why not? This video isn't long enough already. As Naruto and Sasuke have reached their ludicrous levels of power by the end of Naruto, when Boruto rolls around, their only option is to keep bringing back them aliens, which sucks.
a lot. They're all variations of the same character, Kaguya, and they are worse versions of her. So when you make all your main villains worse versions of the worst villain in Shippuden, let's just say your antagonists will leave a lot to be desired. They lack creativity, their powers are boring and unimaginative, and they all have the power to absorb jutsu. I mean, come on, why do they all need the same power? Momoshiki can suck ninjutsu with his Rinnegan hand, Delta can suck chakra with her eyes, ninjutsu doesn't work on Ishiki, I mean, it's all the same power, it's so boring. Back in Shippuden, nullifying jutsu was a very rare ability that only Rinnegan users or characters with six paths and jutsu had. And sure, these new characters are powerful, but making all of them have the same power in Boruto and fight the exact same way is just so boring. I honestly cannot see any difference between Ishiki and Mamushiki fighting. Wow, you make things grow, that's so exciting. Oh look, you just vomited some ninjutsu through your hands. I mean, uh, oh, I'm sorry for the rant. Regardless, power scaling has gotten out of control at the end of Naruto. When either Naruto or Sasuke are able to defeat every single person in the world fighting against them at the same time with ease, that becomes a problem to the writers because they could simply snap their fingers and solve any problem in the universe that doesn't have uh, anything to do with aliens at least. And therefore, investment in the show gets a little flimsy. Oh look! Boruto is having a tough fight against Ao! Oh never mind, Naruto can defeat Ao just by flicking his finger. Oh no, look! It's Great Valley Jiraiya! What are we going to do? Well, Sasuke has 69,420 different jutsus that can instantly kill him, so nobody cares. That's why the story should have ended at the end of Shippuden, when our characters reached a tier of power impossible to rival. But now the writers are backed into a corner, so what do they do? Well, let's nerf our protagonists in the most stupid way we can imagine. Nerfing shonen characters is a tricky deal, especially the protagonists. And yes, Naruto and Sasuke are the protagonists of Boruto. Or are you telling me that you're watching that crap because of Boruto or Sarada or Mitsuki or goddamn Jojo? So why was the nerfing of Naruto and Sasuke so bad? Well, because they were only nerfed for the sake of being nerfed. Usually when characters get nerfed, there will be some sort of development regarding the new condition of the character. Like when Orochimaru got his arm sealed, he went on a quest trying to make Tonari heal his arms and he was doing everything he could to regain his former power so he could achieve his objectives. Or in a non-Naruto example, when Game of Thrones' best swordsman Jamie Lannister lost his right arm, he had to essentially relearn how to be a person. His entire life was defined by the skill with the sword, and now he had to learn how to use his words, negotiate, and be more subtle about things. I really doubt anything resembling that will happen to Naruto or Sasuke. Seeing that their development has stopped at the end of Shippuden, they're probably not going to do anything with them except killing them, maybe. The loss of their powers will only serve as a justification to why Kawaki was able to defeat Naruto, as we saw that happening in Boruto's infamous prologue. To top all that, the way they lost their powers was just so unsatisfying, especially Sasuke's. At least Naruto was able to use a final power-up that looked kinda cool and had an emotional moment with Kurama. Even though most of the emotions were only caused by pure nostalgia, and not for the merit of the narrative. But Sasuke, he went down like a little bitch. That was so stupid. Are you telling me that Sasuke, the most powerful ninja in history tied with Naruto, could not react to baby Boruto swinging a kunai at him? But well, he was, he was possessed by Mumushiki. Ooh. Well, I don't care about that. He's so faster than Borushiki. This is what should have happened. And this is not the only time Naruto and Sasuke are treated like little bitches in Boruto. Uh, they are frequently portrayed uh, in a very incompetent way. 
Because, well, the authors have no other way to justify why they are struggling so much against enemies that are so far below them. Are you gonna tell me that Naruto and Sasuke would not obliterate Shin in two seconds? They could probably beat that piece of trash in classic Naruto. And I know a lot of people loved the Baryon mode, but come on. I thought Naruto would shatter space-time itself from how powerful he should have been with his ultimate power-up that sacrifices Kurama. Using jutsu we never saw before, just destroying entire continents and shit like that. But the whole thing was a glorified fist fight. There were two godlike characters fighting and all we got was a fist fight. That just screams lack of creativity to me. I mean, come on. So in conclusion, power escalation in Naruto made sense and was interesting to follow until Kaguya showed up and ruined everything. I don't think Naruto betrayed its own premise until that point, but once Kaguya arrives, the whole thing goes to shit. Power creep gets completely out of control and the new villains from then on just get worse with worse powers and very uncreative jutsu. Funny how so many problems in the series start at the very same moment, don't you think? Anyway, if you came this far into the video, thank you so much for watching. This was a lot of work to make. Please consider subscribing and liking the video, um, it helps me a lot and I want to grow this channel to, you know, just reach more people. And comment down below, um, give your opinions, uh, I want to see what you guys think all about all this. And if you have any ideas for videos in the future, please let me know. See you next time.